So let's uh, begin the class. So just uh, on the website, I put up an assignment, a group written assignment, so you can check, you can download from the website and read the assignment, okay? So it's uh, <coughs> just asking about the objective in financial management. So we already studied about the objective in financial management. Uh, so it's asking what is the problem uh, with using the stock price as the only uh, objective, right? There was a problem with the stockholders. There was a problem with the bondholders. There was a problem with society, right? So we have to make a paragraph on each of those points. Okay? And then at the end, just say, what is the objective? Or how can we solve that problem to make the objective? What kind of objective can we use? So we're also going to make a kind of study group. So the idea of the study group is we have two assignments to do this assignment and another assignment later in the second part of the course. Each of the assignments are 10% of your final grade. Okay. Also, the idea of a study group is that if you don't understand something in the class, you can discuss okay, with the other people in your study group. So first you can ask the people in the study group and then you can ask me. Okay. If you, do, if you don't uh, understand something. So, uh, <coughs> just you should make a study group by the next class, by the Friday class, okay? It's okay if you don't uh, make a study group, then I just assign a randomly a study group, okay? So just on Friday, I'll ask you <coughs> if you made a study group or if not. So there should be four people in each study group. So it could be that we have an there's 83 students, so we could have one group with three students in it, right? Or if a couple of students are absent, but first let's try for four students in each group. Okay? And uh, then on Friday we'll discuss a little bit more about the you can read this at home. Again, if you have any questions you can ask me on on Friday, okay, about the assignment, okay, so the assignment you'll do together with your study group, just, it's just one page, so you just have to divide the task, in the end you write just a quarter of a page, right, each, something like that, so uh, then let's uh, continue with the class, so we are talking about risk, risk and return, so, uh, the last class, <coughs> we were talking about uh, the hurdle rate. We said it is the uh, equals to an important equation, which we should remember. The hurdle rate is equals to the risk-free rate plus beta times the, implied, the risk premium minus the risk-free rate. So, we are going to calculate those different things. This is the capital asset prices model, right? Expected return equals risk-free rate plus beta times the risk premium, okay? So, we said that one part is the variance. How much does the stock price change, right? And we said we were going to measure that with uh, standard deviation. So we could do that just by looking at the graph. Okay, we could just look at the graph of Microsoft from the year 2000 to the year 2013. And we can see whether Microsoft stock price is changing a lot or little every month. And we could look at another stock, and another stock could be much higher. Then, which would be more risky? The stock that's changing a lot every month or a little every month? A lot. A lot, right? It's more risky. If you uh, invest your money, it can go up more or it can go down more. That's more risky. 
Okay? So, in this case, we're looking at the history of the prices. Is the, is the price changing a lot? Okay? If we look at emerging markets, in just one day, I could look at Korean stock yesterday. In just one day, the stock price could go up 15% or down 15%. That's a very risky stock, right? In, an in another company, the stock price just goes up 1% or down 1% in one day. It's not as risky. Does that make sense? If the price changes more, it's more risky. You can lose your money more than if the price doesn't change much. So that's all we're doing. Looking at the graph here, we said for homework you can look at another graph and compare it to the Microsoft graph, right? And another way we can do that is with numbers. With numbers we use the standard deviation. Okay, Standard deviation tells us how far away from the average is it going. So just I made this, perhaps you did this for homework, right? So we looked at this page in the last uh, class. So just, uh, did anybody calculate for a company? Can you tell me what percent? Yes? What company did you look at? Ford. Ford, Ford Motors. So what was the monthly standard deviation? 23%. Okay, Microsoft it was 27%. So Microsoft is a little bit more risky, quite similar, right, than Ford. Did anybody else calculate the standard deviation? Yes, what company? Uh, hmm? Nestle. 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 And Hershey's. We compared the two. Okay, what, what was the monthly standard deviation? 20.13, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the <coughs> is 91.92. What's the name of the company? Hershey's, like chocolate. Hershey's chocolate, 91, since the year 2000? Yeah. Okay, that seems quite risky for a chocolate company. I'm not surprised by the other ones, but just maybe Hershey's is a little bit surprising, right? Because we said the food company is normally not that. Not, uh, people don't change their buying preference that much, okay? So, there may be a reason why Hershey's has this high standard deviation, right? Maybe it's a risky company, okay? Maybe they had some crisis or some bad management, or maybe they suddenly released a new product, which increased their profits a lot, okay? So, we can look at this monthly standard deviation for the companies, and we can see compare it against other companies. We can take the same time range and we can compare them. <coughs> and then this sheet here is showing the uh, comparing industries. So we can see that <coughs> different industries are uh, different. Uh, standard deviations. So just the link is not working, I'll find another way. So this is uh, the book that we're studying, right? This guy wrote the book, Damar Adam, and uh, he has this kind of uh, information on his homepage, okay? It's related to the book. So we can see that advertising has a standard deviation of 51%, okay? Uh, banks, regional banks, 37%, okay? We can look what's low, what's normally not a risky sector, right? Regional banks, here we see auto and truck is uh, 40%. Uh, down here we can see 32% uh, diversified. So that's what we'd expect. A company is very well, it's a diversified company means it's not really clear what business they're doing. They're doing a lot of different businesses. So their standard deviation is lower. If I'm, if I'm running a lot of different businesses, we said like the ship's going to India, I have less risk, right? Like Samsung is well diversified, for example. They're involved in electronics, in even clothes. Samsung even used to make cars before. So, 
Uh, here we can see 35 is food, food wholesalers, right? We said food is generally not a very risky area. Okay, but what is high risk? Uh, we can see that 71% shipbuilding, software, software, software is traditionally a more risky business, right? That's 71%. So we can compare the standard deviations in this uh, page against our company and also just get an idea of the industry. Uh, how risky is the industry? Can you understand the idea that one industry is more risky than another industry? Software is more risky than food. Can you understand that idea? Generally? Okay. We can make more higher profit or higher loss if we're a software company compared to the food company is more lower loss or lower profit. So we measure this with standard deviations. Okay, so we saw that some students the reason I ask you to do that is that it's good that you can do that by yourself and to get you used to using Yahoo Finance, going to Yahoo Finance, getting some data, having a look at it, okay? So, uh, then let's move on. We talked about the market portfolio in the last class, which is one of, buying one of every stock in the stock market, or at least most of the stocks. And we said that investors adjust for risk. No risk, invest in bonds. A lot of risk, take a loan from the bank and invest in stocks. Okay? So we saw that the US stock market went up about 200%, right, in the last five years. So are you going to go to the bank tomorrow, ask them for a loan? and invest in stocks in the US? Hmm? It's quite risky, right? Anyway, currently the US stock market is very high, so it might come back down again sometime in the future, right? So, we start to talk about beta. Uh, so we have the equation, which is risk-free, Right? So I read, say our hurdle rate. So if you don't know this equation, uh, it's not good, right? You need to know this is the CPM, the CPAM. So risk free rate minus beta times uh, the uh, risk premium. <coughs> or sorry, plus beta times the risk premium. So we. We can see beta is here. This is what we're talking about. Beta is a Greek, Greek alphabet letter. So with beta, how do we get beta? We divide the covariance of any asset with the market by the variance of the market. So that sounds very complicated. We have two big words here. Covariance and variance, right? Well, how do I say covariance in Korean? Can somebody look it up in the dictionary? and also variance. Maybe you studied in high school, it might be. So we, we said variance is like how much it's changing, right? Covariance means does it change together? Do they move together or not, right? How do you say in Korean? Gong bun san. Variance is bun san. Covariance, Gongbun San. Did you study about that before? In high school? Or university? Yes, some people. Okay. So the market changes. That's the variance. The question is does the stock market change with, with the market or against it? Covariance. So the last time I drew the graph, the SP 500 is the market portfolio we're talking about. Okay? Which stock was moving with the market? When, can you remember from the last class? Gucci, uh, the food stock like Nestle, or the video game stock? Gucci was the one moving more with the market. 
Which one was moving opposite to the market? Video game. Video game one. So which one has a higher covariance with the market? Gucci has a higher covariance, right? They're going to have a positive number. The number will be higher, depending. If they move more than the market, it will be even higher, right? <coughs> then the food one doesn't change with the market. So it, it's going to be close to zero. The number, the covariance, is going to be nearly zero. Why? It doesn't have any relationship with the market. Okay? So we're asking, what is the relationship of your stock with the market? Does it have a positive relationship? A little bit positive relationship or a lot of positive relationship? Okay? Or it has very little relationship or no relationship, or it has a negative. The market is going down, right? So <coughs> we use beta. This is how we use beta. Beta is a number which will tell us this. Okay? So <coughs> let's talk about some limitations of this model. So just like any model in finance, we have to make some assumptions. Do you understand the assumption? We assume things are true, but they might, might not be true. Okay? And it can make unrealistic assumptions. But this is true for any model in finance. Okay? The parameters of the model cannot be estimated precisely. So, definition of a market index. So, S&P 500 is a market index. So, an index is basically a list of stocks. Right? So, if I have 10,000 stocks on the market, how many stocks do I need to buy for an index? For the S&P 500, how many stocks? Clue is in the name. How many stocks are on the list in the S&P 500? 500 stocks. Okay, let's look at the S&P 500. Probably you know many of the companies, right? on the S&P 500. So if we do S and this is one of the most famous indexes in the world, right? S&P 500 list, okay? Stock list. It's a list of stocks, 500 stocks. So list of S&P 500 companies. So uh, do you know these kind of companies, 3M? Have you heard of 3M? Right, it tells you the sector. Accenture, do you know Accenture? Adobe, Adobe Reader, no, right? Uh, Amgen, okay, these are mainly US companies. Apple, do you know Apple? No, never heard of it. Bank of America, B, B and T, big financial company, Best Buy is BlackRock, Boeing, do you know Boeing, the airline? So we go on and on, right? There's 500 companies. I guess you know about at least 50 of them, okay? So we're not buying all of the thousands of stock, right, in the US stock market. We're buying these 500 stocks. So this is called an index. Index is a list of stocks, okay? And you can invest in this index, so it means that you can buy financial product, which allows you to follow the index. The index goes up, your money goes up, right? It's like buying one stock in every company. The index goes down, your, your money goes down. So we have to define the index, right? What, I was using the S&P 500. Okay, so we have to say, in any stock market, what is the market index? Then. The company may change during the estimation period. So we talked about Microsoft, and we looked at Microsoft. Is it moving with the market? Is it very variance, or so on? But what about if the company changes? The video game company decides, I'm not going to be a video game company anymore. Instead, I'm going to start selling some soft, different software, okay, like Microsoft Word or Excel. So what if they change their business? Then we're looking at the covariance in the past for video games, but now they changed their business. Okay, so this is another problem. This is always a problem when we're looking at the history, looking at the past to help us to predict the future. Okay? 
That's what we're doing here, looking at the past to say, is this stock risky or not in the future? Is it risky or not? So if, we, if the company changes, then we can, the past information is not as useful. Okay? So this is another problem. So another issue is that when we look at the past, the, the model didn't work well. It didn't explain the past returns well. When we look at the past and we say, was this right? Then it's not that good at, pre at predicting the past return. Okay? The relationship between betas and returns is weak. Other variables seem to be more <coughs> seem to be able to explain differences in return better. So this is a general problem. Is it easy to predict the future? Can we predict the future accurately? No. Can I say that the risk Microsoft's Variance has been just 27%, so that means Microsoft is less risky than another com company. So in the future, Microsoft will be less risky. I can make a guess like that, okay? But it, it's like anything for the future, we, are, we look back in the past and we say, oh, you were wrong. It didn't work out like that, okay? So we just have to try and find the best way that we can for uh, predicting the future. So this, the capital asset pricing model is used very widely. Okay, most people use this. It's not perfect. There are these kinds of problems. Okay. There, but look, the, there's alternatives. We have these kind of alternatives, other ways to calculate risk. But they are quite complicated. So anyway, they use the same two first steps. Every model for calculating risk in finance talks about variance of this is our expected return, this one is low risk. Most of the time it's the profit is around what we expected. Okay? This is high risk. The profit is here and here more often. Okay? Not what we expected. So first they look at variance. Every model looks at variance. Okay? Is the stock close to the expected profit or far away from the expected profit. Then secondly, they look at the diff diversification that we talked about. Risk that we can diversify and then market risk. So they, they look at market risk as important. And then finally, the, C the capital asset pricing model uses this idea of the covariance of the stock with the market portfolio. Okay? that we explained with Gucci and uh, the video game company. The other ones use more things, right? They, they use, here they use economic factors. They calculate more betas. They calculate four betas here, right? They use a lot more data. Okay, but why do financial companies still use the CAPM? These alternative models they can explain the past return better. They use a lot more data. Okay, it's much more complicated. But they're not as accurate when estimating future returns. So they can explain what happened in the past. Okay, economists, generally economists are very good at explaining what happened in the past, right? But when it comes to predicting the future, it's not as easy, okay? So the alternative models are more complicated and require more information. So for most companies, we just use this one because it's simpler. It's not worth the extra trouble of estimating all the extra information in the other models. Okay, they're not, they're not more accurate in the, for predicting the future. So no reason to do that. So that's why people mainly use the CAPM that we are going to study for calculating risk. Okay, so here is just another exercise you can do in Excel just to get you familiar with using Yahoo Finance, okay? So you can check, go to Yahoo Finance, enter a company's name, and we looked at it in the last class. You can check, choose profile on the left, okay? You can check who are the stockholders? Who is the marginal investor? Is it an institutional investor or an individual investor? We were talking about the uh, marginal investors. 
So uh, we can just check on the website. So you can go to Yahoo and here's finance on the left. Then type in your company like Microsoft. We're using as an example in this class, right? <coughs> click on your company. Then click on company. We have profile on the left, okay? Profile of the company here. So we can see we have a uh, stock price profile, the company details, the website, uh, the full-time employees, and the executives. Here we can click on View Insiders. Okay, so here are some insiders we can view. Who is an insider in Microsoft? Who is this? Do you know this person? <coughs> William Gates. Bill Gates, right? So Bill Gates, is he buying or selling stock? Okay. So just I want you to uh, uh, go and uh, find out. Here we have ownership, major holders, right? So top institutional holders, Vanguard Group. Do you know Vanguard Group? Financial company. Okay. How many shares do they own? Okay. Top mutual fund holders. So we can see that in Microsoft, the top uh, holder here is, but direct holder is individual, right? Is uh, William Gates and Stephen Ballmer. Stephen Balmer owns more shares than William Gates. William Gates owns this many shares. Stephen Balmer owns this many shares, right? And what about Vandergaard? They own more shares than, than these two guys, okay? So who is the top holder? Top holder in Microsoft? Institutional holders or private holders? Institutional, Institutional holders, right? We can also see State Street, Capital World, BlackRock, <coughs> So you can go and check this for your own company. So then let's move on to talk more about uh, beta and the risk-free rate. So in the CAPM we have the hurdle rate is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta times the risk premium. So for the next couple of weeks we are going to talk about how do we calculate the risk-free rate? How do we calculate the risk premium? Okay? Then we're going to move on to how do we calculate beta. Okay? There's different ways and different uh, ideas about how to calculate that. So this is a key <coughs> equation. Right? Expected return or hurdle rate equals this. Okay? So we need the three inputs. We need the risk-free rate. We need to find the risk premium. And we need to find the beta of the asset. So first let's talk about the risk-free rates. This is the easiest one. The risk-free rate is the easiest one. Okay? Risk premium next the easiest. Beta more complicated. Okay? So for an investment to be risk-free, we need two conditions. There has to be no default risk, which means it has to be issued by the government, right? If I buy a bond in Samsung, do you think Samsung will pay me back? No, right? Yes, we think they will, but it's not 100% sure. Samsung could go bankrupt. Right? It's a company. Probably not, because it's well diversified, but it could. Right? Then I, it's not a risk-free. We couldn't say it's a risk-free. 
But we already explained for the Korean government. The difference is that the Korean government is uh, <coughs> can raise taxes. Okay? So I would prefer to lend money to the Korean government. Why? Because the Korean government can tax your property. They can make property tax and collect the money to pay back. Okay? So usually it's issued by a government. There can be no uncertainty about reinvestment rates. So it means that we know we're going to get the same percent every year. I invest in the government bond, I figure out I get this percent every year. We did in the time value of money, right? If we buy a zero coupon bond, we can still do the calculation to find or to find the interest rate we get every year. So what does default risk mean? Default risk is important in finance. Also, we refer to this as credit risk or credit default risk. It's the chances that the person who issues the bond will not repay the bond in full. Okay? So I lend money to somebody by buying, they sell me a bond. What are the chances they won't pay me back the money? So, for example, Greece. Greece sold some bonds. They didn't repay them in full. They made a deal just to pay back 50% of the money. Okay? So Greece had some default risk. So not all governments don't have default risk. Right? Recently, Uruguay and Argentina, Ecuador also defaulted on some of their bonds okay? in the last 10 or 15 years. But most countries, it's okay. All right? So, <laughs> so we use, usually we use the government bond rate. Okay? And a point that we should make here is the risk-free rate should be in the same currency that your cash flows are invested in. So if I'm investing in Europe, what government bond is my risk-free rate? Which government bond is my risk-free rate in Europe? Germany. Germany, the lowest risk one, right? Germany. I'm going to buy German bonds. Okay? What about in uh, Korea? What's my risk-free rate? The Korean won. I'm investing in Korea. Korean won. What's the risk-free rate? <coughs> what bond? What bond will I use? Korean government bond. Okay. What about if I'm investing in Brazil? Brazil has its own currency, the Brazilian real. What government? What? is the risk-free rate in Brazil. Brazil We're going to use the Brazilian government bond, okay? So we, we should use the same currency that we are investing in, okay? I'm investing in, I'm Disney and I'm making a new theme park in Brazil. I'm calculating my risk in the Brazilian currency. Brazilian real, I need to use the Brazilian currency, okay? The rate of interest on the Brazilian bond. So here we can check the bond rates. It's not the same for every country. Uh, we do you know Bloomberg? Bloomberg is a business website from the US. So we already used Yahoo Finance. Okay. We looked at the Financial Times, some headlines from the Financial Times in Europe. Now we're looking at Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a uh, Business News website from the US, so we can see those this kind of information here. So we can see here ten year government bond yields the United States one point nine two percent. Okay, this is the important line, the yield. It's like the interest rate you get every year. So what is my risk free rate in the US? What can I write here for the US? Right? If we're calculating in the US, this is going to be 1.92. Is that easy? Yeah. Is that easy? Go to the Bloomberg, find the rate of the 10-year bond in the US, and write it here. Okay? So, what about Canada? It's different, right? It's lower than the US. If I invest in the Canadian dollar. Mexico, Brazil. This is in US dollars. Okay? 
Brazil is selling some bond in US dollars. What about in Europe? What's the risk-free rate in Germany? 0.18, okay? So if you invest in euros, you're just going to get this yield. Okay, Britain, 1.58. France, Italy, Spain, Greece, 11.31, okay? You invest in Germany, you're investing in euros. You invest in Greece, you're also investing in euros. Inflation is the same, right? The real interest rate, we say, is the same for everybody. So what's the difference? Why do I have to pay more for Greece? Or why do I get more interest for investing in Greece than investing in Germany? Nobody wants to invest, to invest in Greece. Why? Uh, because of their fault. Yes, yeah, so we looked at the time value of money. We said there's three things, inflation, the real interest rate, and risk. Okay. So the reason for the difference between Germany and Greece is risk. Inflation is the same. They use the same currency, the euro. Okay. The real interest rate is the same. So people think there's a, a risk that Greece might default. Default, not pay back the full amount of the bond. Okay? Because of the economic problems, or they have a history, they defaulted. So, in Asia, we have Japan. Japan traditionally has a very low yield on their bond. Okay? So Japanese people, one reason why Japanese people invest a lot of money abroad, okay? If you're a Japanese pensioner and you save up one million dollars, okay? Well, I'm rich, I have a million dollars and I invest in Japanese bonds. Am I going to get a lot of money every year? No. No. How much am I going to get? <coughs> Maybe 39 or very low. Is that 3.9 thousand dollars? Right? So, uh, I, ja many Japanese investors for that reason invest abroad. They buy bonds in other countries. In Australia, for example, I can get 2.31%. Okay? Uh, of course, the currency value could change, but we can do some hedging. Hedging. Uh, South Korea, 2.16%, not that different from the US. India, 7.73%. India, we're also talking about inflation here, right? Inflation is higher in India. I'm going to want a higher, higher yield. So, we have these 10 year government bonds, right? Which is the base for the risk free rate. So, here is the euro uh, risk free rate. So, we can see that. Uh, this is 2009, here is Germany, it has uh, two year bonds is the blue line, so that's not important, the red line is important. In 2009, we, we saw Germans, Germany's rate was 3.5%, today it's 0.18%, okay, and Greece's rate was 4.5%, today it's 11%. So what happened since 2009? Why did they change? Why did, at this time investors said, well, we're investing in the euro, so not much difference between Germany and Greece, right? So why did they change their mind? This is in 2012. This is Greece, it was 35% just before it defaulted. And the other countries was all down here. Portugal, up to 20%, okay? Why, what's the difference? Why did the risk-free risk rate change? Is this a risk, could we say this is a risk-free rate? No, right? There's default risk here for Greece. There's default risk for Portugal. These are not risk-free rates, right? So in Europe, the euro currency, we're going to choose the country with the lowest risk which is generally Germany, okay? If we are to say which is a risk-free rate in Germany, this has default risk, this has default risk, this has default risk, okay? Which has the lowest default risk? Germany or the Netherlands, 
Okay. So what about risky government bonds? Governments, let's say, outside of, in Europe, we have a risky government like Greece. But that's not important because we can choose Germany. It's not a risky government, okay, to invest our euros. But what about outside of Europe, where we have a risky government? Let's say Argentina. Argentina defaulted. Okay, can we say that the risk-free rate is the government bond rate in Argentina? Is that risk-free in Argentina? No, Argentina defaulted 10 or 15 years ago. So people think it's not risk-free. So if the government is perceived to have default risk, then the government default rate will, will the government bond will have a default spread. Okay? So the government bond rate is 5%. So this is made up of inflation. Inflation is 3%. Okay? The real interest rate. How much can you remember how much was the real interest rate? We calculated before. It was about 0.5%, right? Or less. Okay, so that's 3.5%. So how much is the default risk? Default risk equals on this bond. The bond is 5%. Inflation is 3%. The real interest rate is 0.5%. How much is the default risk? 1.5? Yes, one, three, 5 minus 3.5. Okay, it must be what's left. Okay, so we said this number is the time value of money, right? This is how much interest I want for one year. Okay, I want 5% interest. The difference between having the money this year and next year. So this is made of inflation, 3%. Real interest rate for patients. And default risk. I think there's a 1.5% risk that the government will default in the next year. Okay? It's not zero. It's 1.5. So some governments are like this. Okay, some governments... In Greece, if we look at inflation in Europe, it's probably around 1 or 2 percent. So Greece's interest rate is 11 percent. So people think there's about 8 or 9 percent chance that Greece will default in the next year, right? That's what that means. So in this case, the government's bond is not risk-free. So there are three choices we have. First we can adjust the local currency government borrowing rate for default risk to get a riskless local currency rate. So an example is India. So in May 2009, the Indian government rupee bond was 7%. We saw that today it's the same, 7%. Okay? The local currency rating from Moody's, who are Moody's? They're a rating agency, Moody's, S&P, and Standards & Poor's. They give a rating for default risk. They make a rating. A, very safe. B, not so safe, right? C, don't invest in the country, that kind of thing. Okay? So Moody's gave them a rating of BA2. And then we can find, if Moody's give a BA2 rating, what percentage is that? That's a 3%. So here, we're saying, what's the default risk for India? What do Moody's say? Moody's say BA2. Then we have a table. BA2 <coughs> equals 3%. Okay? You don't have to calculate this table. This ta you can find this table. Okay? Then, the risk free rate in rupees is 7% minus 3%. So we want to take away the default risk. Okay? In, in the case of this one, it would be minus 1.5% equals 3.5% without the default risk. In India's case, it's 7% minus, take away from India, take away the default risk. Moody says it's 3%, so we believe Moody's. Can we believe Moody's? Yeah, yeah well, sometimes they make mistakes, but generally we can't, right? So we end up with 4% of inflation, and real interest rate. That is the riskiest rate. Okay? 
So we can do the same for Brazil. Okay? We're looking at the example for Brazil. And the rate in 2009 was 11%. The local currency rating was 2.5% VA1. So 11 minus uh, 2.5 equals 8.5%. So uh, we can. S Where is inflation higher, Brazil or India? Where is inflation higher? The risk free rate in Brazil here, 8.5%. In India, 4%. Which country has higher inflation? This number is inflation plus the real interest rate. We took out the default risk, right? So which country has higher inflation, Brazil or India? Brazil, right? Brazil has higher inflation. We can tell from this. Okay, so uh, let's finish there for today. Does anybody have any question? <laughs> Okay, did everybody check the attendance list? Did you check the attendance list yet?